An aristocracy is a type of society that is run by a small, privileged ruling class. These people are often wealthy and famous, and the modern iteration of this concept seems to especially revolve around people who have massive amounts of influence within their respective political establishments. This modern variation is not an aristocracy in the original Greek sense of the word, which is defined as rule by the best, which ideally meant the best at running things, at governing. Instead, we use other attributes that we've come to associate with leadership that we use as stand-ins for actual governing skills. And often this has consequences. Sometimes the stand-in trait that we use to determine who should be in charge is nothing more than a name, a family. Kennedys and Bushes and Clintons have dominated the past several decades of American politics. And how likely is it that members of these particular families are actually the best possible leaders that we have available in a country of almost 330 million people? And as a result of this transference of authority from those with actual leadership traits to those with stand-in traits, our concept of best has become shorthand for most politically connected and financially capable of undertaking the process that leads to attaining the highest of governmental positions. And our interpretation of the term aristocracy, as a result, has become a largely negative one. If we wanted to get more specific with our terminology, we could say that even the most ardent of modern-day liberal democracies are succumbing to plutocratic rule, plutocracies being, in essence, a type of oligarchy, and oligarchies being similar to aristocracies, though rather than power typically falling to members of high-born lineages, as with modern aristocracies, Oligarchies are societies in which the power is held by the fortunate few, sometimes surreptitiously and indirectly, pulling the strings from behind the throne, as it were, and sometimes with members of that wealthy or otherwise influential and small ruling class actually at the helm, perhaps as president or prime minister, in which case that oligarchy is also a plutocracy. So when all the powerful people stay behind the scenes pulling the strings, it's an oligarchy. When some of those powerful people are also center stage, it's a plutocracy. And when the people in charge are from a long line of powerful, influential, wealthy people who tend to run things, it's an aristocracy. There are other colorful ocracies that have reemerged in the press and public conversation of late. Some of these terms are commonly used in the study of governmental structures, and some are more the product of pop culture, or invented to describe a very specific situation or government. A cacistocracy is a country run by the most horrible, least qualified, or most unscrupulous citizens. And yes, its original, literal Greek meaning is government by the worst people. This term originally appeared in writings in the 19th century and was used to describe the opposite of an aristocracy, a term that, again, at the time, meant the benevolent ideal of rule by the best people available. This term fell out of vogue as the term aristocrat evolved to take on its modern meaning, but the term cacistocracy gained new life with the election of Donald Trump to the U.S. presidency as many of his detractors saw him as not just unqualified for the position, but actually the worst type of human being, and someone who wouldn't just be bad at the job, but would actually hurt the country and government by being there, a worse option than almost anyone else you could put into that position of power. Related to cacistocracy in some ways is the term kleptocracy, which is a government that is run by thieves, this term refers to a ruling class that takes power in order to essentially embezzle that power and the wealth of a country for their own purposes and into their own pockets and into the pockets of their supporters. 
This term is generally applied to dictators and military rulers, to autocrats, in short, for whom there is little or no oversight, and who have absolute control over the reins of power. When there's no free press, for instance, to report on a ruler's actions, that ruler is able to do things that someone who is reported upon by a free and open press could not, not without the people possibly coming to know about their actions, at least. And so people like Russian President Vladimir Putin is often referred to as the head of a kleptocracy, because although he goes through the song and dance of a democracy, he actually has effectively removed anyone who might be able to challenge him, politically or journalistically, and has amassed a vast fortune for himself in myriad holdings around the world. It's estimated that he may actually be the wealthiest man on the planet, due to his many years of soaking up government profits for himself. But this is difficult to confirm with hard numbers due to the secretive nature of how he extracts wealth from the Russian economy. The indication, you might say, of a successful kleptocracy. There's an older form of government that isn't referred to very often, but which has existed in many different flavors around the world throughout modern history. A timocracy is a government under which those who own property may participate, but those who do not may not participate. This is a system in which those who rule, those who own land, usually, and therefore make decisions for themselves, also make decisions for those who do not own land and who therefore do not get to participate in the government. They feel little or no civic responsibility and instead act in ways that allow them to defend their own property and their own personal rights most effectively, without having to consider any of the needs or desires or priorities of their countrymen who are not capable of defending themselves within that government. There are echoes in this system within some forms of extreme libertarianism, but the true very close analogy, I would argue, is found in another ocracy. And this other ocracy is the governing structure that I want to focus on today, as it has played a substantial role in legal and economic decisions for the better part of a century, if not longer. But it's also on the verge of possibly becoming an even bigger part of our lives, all of us, wherever we might live on the planet, in the very near future. Today, I want to talk about corporatocracy. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is a listener-supported show. A huge thanks to everyone who's already helped support the show in some way at some point already. Your contributions, whatever shape they might take, are very much appreciated. Thank you very much. And if you're enjoying what you hear, consider contributing in some way that makes sense for you. There are a lot of different ways to do this. You can set up a monthly contribution over on Patreon at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. If you do so, you will also gain access to an ad-free version of the show and the discussions that take place over there, along with a bunch of additional content. You can also make a one-time contribution or a monthly contribution through PayPal, through Venmo, and you can contribute non-monetarily as well by leaving a review up on iTunes, by sharing the show with a friend, by sharing it to your social network. All of these contributions, no matter what size, no matter what shape they might take, are super helpful and very much appreciated. Again, thank you very much to everyone who has already contributed, and thank you in advance if you are considering doing so. Another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors, the first of which today is HostGator, the hosting company that I have very happily used for many, many years. If you go to HostGator.com LKT, you will receive a substantial discount off of their already very reasonable prices. HostGator.com slash LKT. And the other sponsor today is Everlane, my favorite clothing company. A ridiculous percentage of my entire wardrobe comes from Everlane. They make really wonderful products that never go out of style, that last a very long time, and which are not slathered in logos. If you go to letsknowthings.com slash Everlane, a percentage of any purchase that you make from their website will be given as a contribution to the show. That's letsknowthings.com slash Everlane. All right, let's get back to the show. 
How should we decide who is in charge? Leaving aside for the moment the question of whether or not anyone should be in charge, anarchy, to my mind, isn't super feasible, at any significant scale, at least at the moment, and technologies that could make such a system or a variation of it tenable for most people are decades in the future, if they do emerge at all. But that aside, I don't know that we've ever had universal agreement about this question of how we should decide who governs. At any given moment in human history, there have been numerous methods of choosing our rulers, and that's been true even when the majority of governing systems in a region have been similar for a time due to the technology and economic needs of the moment. But there have always been variations and outliers and completely different models just a few hundred miles away. Now that said, there have been trends at different historical moments in time, things that, although not universal, can be pointed at as general rules that were often bent and broken, but still represented a decent percentage of the population in a region for a time. Pre-civilization, that is, pre-agriculture in more nomadic hunter-gatherer times, it would have been the strongest or the cleverest, probably, that would have ruled. Small human groups would have been dominated and organized and controlled by those who helped the group survive. In some cases, especially after developing some means of pre-currency exchange, this position might have been hereditary, as wealth could have been then hoarded and handed down based on genetics, based on heredity, giving advantage to the children of former rulers. But in most cases, at this point in history, it was kind of a biological meritocracy, with the biggest, baddest, most cunning, most diplomatic, or in some cases simply the oldest, with the most life experience, taking the reins, depending on the needs of the group. We saw a lot of patriarchies, and in some cases matriarchies around this period. The basis of group order was similar to how one might manage a family. Later, those who were best able to organize and benefit from agriculture and all its associated systems were the ones in charge. So those with mines for infrastructure and maintenance, or those who were good at controlling those mines, would often be in positions of power. With these systems in place, concepts like territory and possessions became more vital, and this resulted in organizational bodies in which not just being able to build a society, but also being able to protect that society, and all its accoutrement was important. So those who could lead armies and manage militaries were also often perched somewhere high up the societal pyramid, if not at the very top. Eventually, we ended up with very formalized and well-honed systems of royalty, where the power was handed down from blood relative to blood relative, or to those who were brought in to the royal family through marriage. These royals became the symbols of the people, their mascots, the stand-in for who they felt they were as a group, but also the lords of the people, their leaders. This was not a system predicated on decisions being made by first among equals, as fathers and mothers of the village, as we might have expected in pre-agrarian societies, but rather these were people who were of a higher status than the everyday person, and in some cases they were perceived to be gods, something more than human, as we saw in Egypt, in Mesoamerica, in parts of Africa, and throughout Europe at different times. All over the planet, really, we saw groups that deified their rulers, their mascots. It was a big trend for a while. As more groups came into contact with each other, however, neutral units of exchange became increasingly important as a means of trading value for value with strangers. And as a result, the role of leadership was increasingly not just to make sure that food was produced and their people were protected, but also that the currencies and markets were well managed. These systems also often evolved to allow people to operate on a credit system. At the most simple level, this meant that the coins or the notes or the other currency, the symbols of value, 
that they used for exchange were representations of actual wealth that was held by the local royalty, rather than everybody carrying around actual items of value. But complex versions of this credit system allowed both rulers and citizenry to tap into local resources in a new way, both human resources and things like building materials, to produce things that they could not yet afford, with value that didn't quite exist or only theoretically existed. So credit helped in that regard as well. It meant that someone could say, I want to build this massive new swath of farmland, but I won't be able to afford to do it until the farmland is built. Once that new value is generated, then I will have enough value to have built that farmland. And the ruler could say, okay, cool, I'll totally front you that money, and you can pay me back with interest once you have created that new asset. Credit, then, not only allowed people to work with these neutral units of exchange backed by the local ruler, but it also allowed for the production of more value on the back of theoretical future value that would become available as a result of that production. This single credit-related innovation massively expanded markets of those cultures that developed it. It eventually led to some crises later on in many cultures, but at first especially, it was a very big advantage for those who had it. These governing bodies became more complex and vast as time went on, in part because they were responsible for keeping track of more people, more resources, more land, but also because rules tend to beget rules, which tend to beget more rules. So these ruling systems grew increasingly more complex to manage their own complexity, but also to manage the complexity of their growing community. Now, there are benefits to having more laws, more rules, and more overall complexity when managing a very complex system. But there are also downsides, like the friction inherent in cumbersome bureaucracies. A lot of the governments that exist today exist in part to manage their own unwieldy bulk and to try to keep their own opaque operations from getting out of hand and becoming completely unmanageable. In other words, there are entire governing systems that specialize in governing the government and which seem to accomplish very little else beyond that. Modern governments fulfill many of these same duties that governments of the past existed to fulfill. They make rules and enforce them. They manage the markets and currency. They protect their people from internal and external threats. And, I would add, and this is an often unspoken trait that runs through almost all of these historical government examples as well, these governments do their best to perpetuate themselves. Few governments exist to bring another type of government into being, or even take seriously the possibility that they could or should ever be replaced. So one of a modern government's main features is to self-perpetuate much like a living entity that feels biologically driven to make sure that its own heritage lives on into the future. Now that's a very simplistic rundown of governmental function, but it's a good jumping off point for what I want to talk about today. Consider what we just discussed, that governments are responsible for creating and enforcing rules, for managing markets and currency, and for protecting their citizenry against threats both internal and external. Now ask yourself, how many of those responsibilities have been outsourced, that is, hired out to non-government entities, to companies, perhaps, to corporations that specialize in protecting foreign oil fields in which we have an economic state, or who specialize in locking up criminals and keeping our prisoners separate from the rest of society. I will dig deeper into that idea a little bit later, but I wanted to make that point up front so that you can have it in mind as we come around and approach that topic from another angle, starting with an article from Wired Magazine, which is entitled, Meet Project Zero. Google's Secret Team of Bug-Hunting Hackers. Project Zero is an interesting and not entirely, but somewhat novel creature in the corporate world. 
And this article, which I will link to in the show notes, does a good job of explaining the genesis of the project and how it works and the rationale behind it. Here is a quote from the first two paragraphs of that article, which I think capture the vibe of this project quite nicely. Quote, when 17-year-old George Hotz became the world's first hacker to crack AT&T's lock on the iPhone in 2007, the companies officially ignored him while scrambling to fix the bugs his work exposed. When he later reverse-engineered the PlayStation 3, Sony sued him and settled only after he agreed to never hack another Sony product. When Hotz dismantled the defenses of Google's Chrome operating system earlier this year, by contrast, the company paid him a $150,000 reward for helping fix the flaws he'd uncovered. Two months later, Chris Evans, a Google security engineer, followed up by email with an offer. How would Hotz like to join an elite team of full-time hackers paid to hunt security vulnerabilities in every popular piece of software that touches the internet? End quote. So the project is a bit like those heist films where someone goes around and recruits a bunch of highly skilled, highly specialized criminals, but they're all criminals with big hearts, you know? So they're totally interested in using their skills to take down a bad guy or rob a casino because screw casinos. Not all the members of Google's Project Zero are hackers who were taken to court by major corporations for finding security flaws in their products, but some are. And those who are not apparently have comparable skills and mindsets because their purpose, the whole reason that Project Zero exists, is to find such flaws and help fix them. Project Zero gets its name from so-called zero-day attacks, which are cyber attacks that make use of security holes that the creators of the software don't know about. So the attack occurs and the companies that make that software have zero days in which to create a patch that fixes the vulnerability. Project Zero seeks to wipe out such vulnerabilities before they can become zero-day attacks. What makes Project Zero stand out from other similar teams operating inside corporations around the world is that they see their jurisdiction as not just Google software and systems, but the entire internet. Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and their competitors and comrades of all shapes and sizes around the world have internal red team-like setups, meaning they have hired hackers working for them, looking for flaws in their own systems and software, attacking their own infrastructure so they can patch any security holes that might exist there before malicious hackers can find and exploit them. But because Google's well-being is so inextricably tied to the well-being of the internet as a whole and people's reliance on and trust in and use of the internet, they decided that it was in their best interest to ensure that the internet was doing well. Everything that touched the internet, and that very much includes systems and software made by other companies that also touch the internet. Another quote from that article, quote, and what does Google get out of paying top-notch salaries to fix flaws in other companies' code? Evans insists Project Zero is primarily altruistic, but the initiative, which offers an enticing level of freedom to work on hard security problems with few restrictions, may also serve as a recruiting tool that brings top talent into Google's fold where they may later move on to other teams. And as with other Google projects, the company also argues that what benefits the internet benefits Google. Safe, happy users click on more ads. If we increase user confidence in the internet in general, then in a hard-to-measure and indirect way, that helps Google too, Evans says. End quote. The best analogy that I could think of for what Google is doing here is something like a small business operating out of a neighborhood that they really want to flourish. And in fact, their own existence is in some ways predicated on their neighborhood flourishing. If crime is rampant and people are afraid to come around to visit this business and buy things because people have heard rumors that they might get shot or robbed if they show up in that neighborhood, well, that business won't be 
in business for very long, will it? So that business might hire security, and that might work pretty well inside their building, keeping the riffraff from entering, but it doesn't do much to clean up the neighborhood as a whole or change the perception about that neighborhood. Project Zero, in this imagined scenario, is a private security force that is patrolling the neighborhood. And they're picking up trash and they're cleaning up graffiti, but they're also carrying guns and holding riot shields. They're defending other neighboring businesses as well. They're making sure that visitors to the neighborhood can wander the streets freely. They can go window shopping. And they're making sure that no one breaks into their cars while they're inside. Now, this comparison between Project Zero and a private police force is not a perfect one, but it's close enough that many of the same pros and cons apply. I recently moved to Memphis, Tennessee, here in the U.S., for instance, and there are some parts of town that I've been repeatedly warned from many different people against even driving through, much less visiting, parking my car, and getting out to walk around to check out any business that might still exist in that neighborhood. I can think of many people who live in neighborhoods like that, both residents and business operators, who would love to have a security force walking around patrolling, someone who can pick up the slack for the police, who for many different reasons are not able to prevent or even stifle the preponderance of crime in the area. On the other hand, I can also imagine a neighborhood like this changing in dramatic ways, and not necessarily for the better, if it is suddenly being patrolled by armed and armored private security. There's that famous Roman saying that translates into something like, who will guard the guards themselves, though it's more often phrased today as who will watch the watchman. What if we accidentally replace one type of criminality with another type of criminality? What if these security forces begin to enforce cultural norms, not just strict by-the-book law? What if certain types of people come to be harassed by this private force, despite having done nothing wrong? What if, with time, power flows to those who control this security force? How might that power be abused, now or in the future, by those who hold the reins today, and by those who might hold those reins in the future? Who will watch the watchmen, and who will keep them from becoming a bigger threat than the threats that they are helping alleviate? Another question worth asking is where the powers of this private police force end, and where they overlap with the existing actual police force and the powers that they wield. What happens when these two forces begin to step on each other's toes? How might a power struggle between the two sides play out? Are actual cops being put at greater risk when weaponized rent cops are patrolling the area? And what risks are the private security forces taking on by brandishing those weapons and acting as if they have authority that they may not actually have, at least according to the rule of law, rather than the practical rules of the street? There's a now famous blog post that was written by a Google security engineer in the days following the leak by former government security contractor Edward Snowden that revealed the NSA has made full, gleeful use of zero-day flaws in American-made software, including software made by Google, as spying tools against both foreign and domestic persons of interest. This blog post came to be known as the Fuck These Guys post, because the engineer says those words about the NSA, and goes on to describe how frustrating it is that they work so hard and invest so many resources in trying to keep their systems and software safe and usable, and the NSA, a wing of their own government, is identifying, utilizing, and keeping secret the very flaws they're trying to patch. This would be like if Google has their private security forces guarding only their own building, and the actual cops were out there on the streets stealing from potential visitors and planting listening devices on their cars. Even if these actual cops might have the legal ability to harass people in that way, it really messes with the public perception of that neighborhood and fundamentally weakens the position of Google and the other businesses in their space. This, as much as anything else, was part of Google's rationale 
for branching out and patrolling the internet neighborhood themselves. But mentioned in that last quote that I read from the Wired article was one more detail that may or may not influence the way that we think about this new dynamic. Safe, happy users click on more ads. Should that matter? Should it matter that a huge part of why Google is doing this thing that could prove to be very beneficial for everyone, including their direct competitors, should it matter that they're doing it because they believe it incentivizes us to click on more ads, to do something that many of us feel is in opposition to our personal well-being, the endless cycle of notifications and advertisements and compulsory consumption. But it is something that is a vital necessity for Google. It's their lifeblood. It might help to think about this in a slightly different way. What if your employer started offering medical treatments that would allow you to live forever? And they offered these treatments for free to all of their employees, and they considered it to be worth the cost because they estimated that, well, hey, immortal people can work a lot longer, which means dramatically reduced employee turnover, which then dramatically reduces their cost of operation. And they decide that it is monetarily worthwhile for them to offer this amazing benefit to their employees. But as part of having access to that benefit, you actually become tethered to the job, to a larger system that may or may not actually be beneficial to you in a more holistic, complete sense. Now, I don't think that there's an honest black or white answer to that question, not for most people anyway. Or maybe that analogy only really works for people who are fascinated by the idea of living forever, so I might be showing my bias there. But if you imagine gaining something excellent and desirable, and in exchange you're giving up something that you might not even care about or notice, because all it really does is extend and possibly expand the current status quo for you, while also benefiting some big corporation in ways that you almost certainly won't notice, then you're thinking about it correctly. It's a tricky question, and it's just one manifestation of something that we're seeing a lot more of each year, namely corporations taking on the responsibilities traditionally held by government. In this case, the responsibility being shifted to Google is that of cyber defense. But in other cases, it's maintaining and expanding markets and currencies. We see this in the numerous stock trading and managing apps and platforms, in private loan companies and private banks and investment funds. Arguably, we see it in seedling form, in different cryptocurrencies, and in digital payment tools like PayPal and Square. In other cases, we see corporations building private prisons and hiring out private mercenary forces to fight our battles overseas and to defend our financial interests locally. In still other cases, we see corporations handling the logistics and last mile installation of government infrastructural projects like laying fiber optic cables for high speed internet in rural regions and building electricity substations for expanding cities. Google is not the only company building their own combat ready fighting force, and plugging security holes is not the only responsibility being allocated to corporation-owned rent-a-cops. We are already seeing companies like Microsoft go after hacking groups like Fancy Bear, which is the Putin-affiliated hacker group that's technically independent of the Russian government, but in a nudge-nudge-wink-wink -wink sort of way. This is the group that targeted the Democratic National Convention in 2016. But Microsoft's means of doing so, of striking back, are currently limited to legal weaponry. They're targeting the hacker group's infrastructure. To better understand what I mean by that, here is a quote from the Daily Beast from an article on this particular subject, which is entitled, Putin's Hackers Now Under Attack, from Microsoft. Quote, Last year, attorneys for the software maker quietly sued the hacker group known as Fancy Bear in a federal court outside Washington, D.C., accusing it 
of computer intrusion, cyber squatting, and infringing on Microsoft's trademarks. The action, though, is not about dragging the hackers into court. The lawsuit is a tool from Microsoft to target what it calls the most vulnerable point in Fancy Bear's espionage operations, the command and control servers the hackers use to covertly direct malware on victim computers. These servers can be thought of as the spy masters in Russia's cyber espionage, waiting patiently for contact from their malware agents in the field, then issuing encrypted instructions and accepting stolen documents. Since August, Microsoft has used the lawsuit to wrest control of 70 different command and control points from Fancy Bear. The company's approach is indirect but effective. Rather than getting physical custody of the servers, which Fancy Bear rents from data centers around the world, Microsoft has been taking over the internet domain names that route to them. These are addresses like livemicrosoft.net or rsshotmail.com that Fancy Bear registers under aliases for about $10 each. Once under Microsoft's control, the domains get redirected from Russia's servers to the companies cutting off the hackers from their victims and giving Microsoft an omniscient view of that server's network of automated spies. In other words, Microsoft outside counsel Stan Jensen explained in a court filing last year, anytime an infected computer attempts to contact a command and control server through one of the domains, it will instead be connected to a Microsoft-controlled secure server, end quote. So this is a counterattack method that still fits squarely under the traditional government-moderated way of doing things. Microsoft is defending itself and its own infrastructure by attacking that of a rival, but it's not replicating the powers of any existing government police force. It's getting that existing police force to intercede on its behalf. It is, in effect, calling the cops to help them hit very specific weak points of a criminal network. And that's how a lot of the corporate task forces of this kind operate right now. But that could change. Extra governmental powers being claimed by non-governmental entities is not a new thing. Not even non-governmental entities controlling entire militias and conquering other nations is new. The British East India Company initially dominated trade in the so-called East Indies, but went on to actually fight wars against its rivals, including the French East India Company, which is one of its fellow joint stock companies, a joint stock company being an early version of a modern corporation. These military conflicts with their French counterparts, again, all parties were still private at this point, separate from their government, eventually led to British military and trade dominance in India and the expansion of the British Empire to include direct rule of that whole region. So before the government stepped in and rendered the British East India Trading Company obsolete, eventually breaking it apart in the 19th century, this company, this early corporation, opened diplomatic ties with Japan, enjoyed a trade monopoly with several colonies, fought wars, dominated governments, and lorded over a huge swath of the world for a few hundred years, from the early 1600s until the late 1800s. And there were clearly advantages to this setup for the British crown, but also for the company itself. It was able to act unilaterally when necessary to do things the government couldn't do, either because of bureaucracy or inconvenient laws or public opinion, or because the relevant politicians were simply too far away and a decision needed to be made post-haste. At the same time, the government could influence the efforts of this company, and as I mentioned, even step in to take control of assets and conquered territories when appropriate. It was kind of a win-win, except, of course, for those who they stepped over while they expanded the empire and attained more wealth for their investors. Might this be a useful type of relationship to revisit? Might it be prudent, for instance, for the United States to allow Google and other companies that exist within its borders to strike out on their own sometimes, to break free of inconvenient laws and norms when it's beneficial for them and their government to do so, when it allows them to compete on a more 
even playing field when fighting against the bad guys? This question brings us back to that analogy of the local business patrolling their neighborhood with private military, essentially. At what point do the downsides of the local independent security force outweigh the benefits? At what point does that security force raiding the homes and hideouts of the local criminals get out of hand? At what point do things like assassinations of those criminals and the bombing of their homes become a step too far? These questions are theoretical for most of us when they stick to the world of technology, but it's worth remembering there are a lot of types of companies out there, and some of them are private military companies, corporations that go to war for governments and sometimes for other corporations, and this same question applies to them as well. So what if it wasn't just Google and other tech companies that were given a longer leash, allowing them to strike back against the bad guy hackers in new ways? What if these security contractors were also allowed to legally raid bases held by enemy combatants? What if they were given free reign to blow up terrorist training camps and assassinate suspected drug kingpins? without having to go through government channels to get permission. One of the ocracies that I mentioned in the intro to this episode is particularly relevant to this conversation, and that is corporatocracy. A corporatocracy is an economic and or political system controlled by corporations. Economist Jeffrey Sachs, who mentioned the term in his 2011 book, the price of civilization, said that the modern American corporatocracy emerged from four main trends. Weak national parties and strong political representation of individual districts, the large U.S. military establishment after World War II, big corporate money financing election campaigns, and globalization tilting the balance away from workers. Now, it's important to note, too, that this term is very often confused with or conflated with other similar-sounding terms, but it should not be confused with, for instance, corporate capitalism, which is a term that describes economic ownership within a capitalistic system, rather than implying governmental control. So a corporatocracy implies that the government is controlled by corporate interests, whereas Corporate capitalism is about who owns the wealth within a system, but doesn't say anything about whether or not that wealth garners them influence within the governing system. It also shouldn't be confused with corporatism, which is a theory of social organization that divides society by specialty or interest group. So if you were to divide up a nation by military, agriculture, education, energy, steel, and so on, interest groups based on the field in which you work, that would be a corporatist organizational structure. And it also shouldn't be confused with a corporate republic, which is a theoretical governmental structure that would essentially be run like a business. So instead of having elected officials, you would have CEOs and a board of directors and managers at various levels. Anything that could be privatized would be privatized and citizens would be treated more like employees rather than civilian members of a nation. Now, a corporatocracy, again, depending on how you see modern economic systems, is theoretically a very real thing, and particularly within the United States and within other nations that similarly favor corporate interests, in many cases over individual interests. So that's something that's already a reality that is worth knowing about. But other concepts along these lines, like the idea of a corporate republic, are also instructive, I think, in that they show us what future nations or pseudo-nations, different organizational structures of governance, might look like. And they allow us to guess at how these new systems might fit in with the current system, with everyone else, with more traditional governmental structures and how the world might change as a result of that potential clash. There's another concept worth mentioning here that I think fits in well with this conversation, 
And much like the idea of a corporate republic, this is a concept that is a frequent fixture of certain types of speculative science fiction. And that concept is the mega corporation. Mega corporations are often featured in the cyberpunk genre in particular, which features these scaled up versions of modern corporations that have come to take on many or most or all of the responsibilities that governments today currently dominate. Things like security, like military efforts, like social services, all of these things are divvied out by these very often fantastically named mega corporations that, depending on the storyline in question, also very often end up going to war with each other or going to war with governments and essentially operating in a weird space between government and corporation and sometimes like a mafia almost. Now, some people claim that many of today's corporations are already stepping into the role, in some instances at least, and in some perhaps narrow cases, as mega corporations. And that claim unto itself is kind of interesting, but there's another concept that is one step even further along the corporation speculation spectrum that I think is instructive here. And it was used to great effect by the science fiction author Kim Stanley Robinson. I believe it was in his Mars trilogy. And I think it fairly aptly describes where things could go from here. Whether or not you believe that we already have early mega corporations in our myths, I think this speculative next step is very much worth considering. And that next step is called a meta-national corporation. This is a term that was originally coined in nonfiction literature by Jose Santos, Peter Williamson, and Yves Eldos in their 2001 book, From Global to Metanational. And in that book, they described a metanational as a company that builds a new kind of competitive advantage by discovering, accessing, mobilizing, and leveraging knowledge from many locations around the world. Now, that was the first instance of it being used in a nonfiction book, but I believe Robinson got there first using the term to track the evolution of corporations that in his books began as transnationals or transnats that emerged in the 21st century into metanationals or metanats that came later, that were the next step. The former, transnats, were corporations that straddled multiple nations and played well with multiple governments. So the way that, for instance, a business like Apple has on-the-ground entities and headquarters all around the world, and the way that it could conceivably continue to survive and even thrive if it left the United States, that is one trait of a transnat, as envisioned in these books. These are companies that are stateless in that they are of many states rather than just one. Metanats, on the other hand, within the context of these books, were corporations that were outside and even eventually above nations, as implied by the term meta. They were not just playing well with everyone, they were actually outside the jurisdiction of anyone. So no governments could rein them in, no laws could be applied to them at least not when they were in territory that they controlled. So these were corporations that, for most intents and purposes, operated like governments, but had the structure and growth potential of corporations. And they also lacked the social and civil responsibilities that tend to be inherent in governments to different degrees, except for those that were encouraged by their desire for financial continuity and growth meaning they didn't feel the need to serve the people under their influence and protection, but would do so if it made financial sense. Throughout much of this type of fiction, metanational corporations are imagined to spring up as soon as new territory becomes available. And I think this is in large part because national borders today are fairly rigid and largely respected. Recent bouts of asymmetric aggression from Russia along their borders notwithstanding, a general adherence to Westphalian sovereignty has ensured that, except during full-scale wars, we even respect the borders of our sworn enemies 
There's just too much to lose, too many downsides to taking land from other nations, except in the most extreme and unusual circumstances. If new technologies and systems were to emerge that allowed cities to be built on the open sea, which are often today called seasteads, that could completely change this dynamic. It wouldn't be just existing nation-states making new claims, trying to float their cities to the best oceanic real estate. It would be private groups with ideologies that are perhaps not favored amongst most governments. It would be Silicon Valley billionaires, some of whom, including Peter Thiel, have already laid bare their plans to do just that, to get out from under government regulations that they see as oppressive. I think we'd almost certainly see religious groups do the same. Groups who believe in polygamy, for instance, and who are not able to practice polygamy under the governments of most Western nations because they say no way. That's not the type of thing we want in our society. You can't do that here. If you are someone who believes that polygamy is a necessary component of a holy life, well, it, it might just make sense to build yourself a city out on the open ocean so that you can make your own laws and live in accordance with those holy decrees that you're trying to follow. Corporations would almost certainly do the same, especially if they believed that they would be able to grow or be more effective if not under the influence of those governments and regulations. The same is true if we look at expansion into the larger universe. In the case of the Mars trilogy that I mentioned, but also any number of other works of speculative fiction, metanationals really come into their own when the opportunity arises to spread their wings and fly off planet. Maybe they start out as a mining facility on the moon or a research base on Mars. Maybe they get some initial funding from the government, but they're out there. It's a private company lording over an entire planet. That's kind of a game changer. I mean, yes, conceivably, earthbound governments could still try to exercise influence over these outposts if they did something they didn't like, but how realistic is a police action or a military action against a base on Mars, especially if this base is financially important to the earthbound government or governments that funded it, that gave them some of the resources and permissions that they needed to get there to start mining whatever, or to start providing fuel for other space missions to do vital experiments that they need for research. How realistic would it be that the governments of the world would do anything if this far-off base started to go rogue, to act like the rules no longer applied to them, to become, more or less, their own nation, their own government, making their own rules. Now take a second to imagine that there are non-government entities like this out there, maybe in the ocean, floating in big cities, maybe in space, maybe in bits of land that are sold to them by traditional governments, places where they, though, get to operate independently like governments, but still as corporations. In some ways, things would not change much at all, because today corporations already do enjoy a great deal of exemption from certain laws that other entities, including individual humans, are forced to deal with. In other ways, though, things could be substantially different. Imagine, for instance, that Apple, floating out there in the high seas, maybe somewhere in the Pacific, their city-sized vessel housing all their employees and their customer citizens, beautiful and minimal and somewhat underpowered and expensive compared to other such vessels, but generally less prone to viruses. It's floating out there, and imagine that Apple is trying to create a trade deal with the government of Chile to buy the majority of their lithium output, which is necessary for their batteries. But then Facebook, which is usually located further north on their own floating city, where they've got their server farms in bubble domes on the seabed under the Arctic Ocean, they show up, they sail on down to South America to try to get that same lithium output. And they say, no way, man, we're going to need that lithium to make batteries for our mini satellite array so that we can beam internet down on the planet from space and get everybody to like more things and share more things all the time. In traditional circumstances, under governmental law, even under a corporatocracy, where corporations control many economic mechanisms from the background, this would result in a bidding war, but under slightly different circumstances, in which corporations are no longer beholden to governmental laws, 
but are instead able to do whatever floats their boat, pun intended, it could result in an updated version of what, in fiction at least, is usually called corporate warfare. What we see of this type of conflict today is largely economic competition, especially when it comes to keeping an opponent from acquiring resources that they need. This can include things like lithium stockpiles, but it can also mean access to the right employees, and it can mean legal battles that are fought around patents and other types of intellectual property. A famous recent example of this is that of Apple Inc. versus Samsung Electronics Company, which was the first of many lawsuits, some of which are still ongoing today, between Apple and Samsung over design and user interface elements used for their smartphones and tablets. The first of these lawsuits was launched by Apple in spring of 2011, and from there, countersuit followed countersuit until August of 2011, when there were 19 lawsuits in nine different countries. One year later, these two companies were entangled in over 50 lawsuits in countries around the world. Apple eventually won the initial lawsuit in the U.S., but Samsung won similar lawsuits in South Korea, Japan, and the UK. Later, at the end of 2016, that initial victory that Apple enjoyed in the US was overturned by the Supreme Court, but that one overturned decision only accounted for $400 million of the many billions of dollars worth of damages that were being litigated between the two companies. And if you add in the legal fees that they were both collectively racking up between them, it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that these lawsuits were not being leveled for the usual purpose of trying to right a wrong by balancing the value books. Apple is not going to thrive or fail based on the outcome of this type of lawsuit, nor is Samsung. These lawsuits instead are being used as weapons in a corporate war between rival pseudo-nation states. They're making use of the weapons that are available to them to try to weaken their enemy. And again, because they're operating under the laws of the lands in which they're headquartered and in which they sell their products, the weapons at hand are primarily legal ones. Now imagine what a similar conflict might look like between corporations that are unencumbered by the laws of existing governments. I think some of the decisions made by the CEOs ruling such meta-state entities would be better than the government equivalents because they would, presumably, still be kept in check and moderated morally, if you want to call it that, by the global marketplace. They would hesitate to declare open war, for instance, because who wants to buy a smartphone from abusive militaristic international bullies? On the other hand, it seems likely that there are things that keep governments in check that we might come to miss if they were lacking in a giant powerful entity like a corporation that became unconstrained from current legal realities. There are decisions all made by a board of directors and a CEO based on economic factors alone. I don't think Apple would be very likely to go to actual physical war with Samsung. I mean, Apple was still buying computer chips from Samsung even while they were deeply embroiled in all that litigation. So they're brazen opportunists on both sides of that conflict. But how about Raytheon, or Monsanto, or Blackwater? These are also corporations, and they all have shown themselves to be less beholden to public sentiment than customer-facing entities like Apple. Blackwater runs a private military force. Monsanto markets questionable gene-altered agricultural products. Raytheon makes weapons of war for anyone who asks. Is there any question that such groups would probably make decisions that an individual or government, driven by different incentives, would not make? I think that it's a fairly safe assumption, unless of course there were other moderating factors put into place, like a stronger international alliance of nations perhaps, or some kind of strong economic incentive to not resort to violence, a global market management body with teeth maybe, if not an international governing body. That could help tie both traditional governments and non-traditional pseudo-nations together. But it's hard to say if even that would be capable of providing the incentives necessary for everyone to get along most of the time, and these newly empowered corporations to not become abusive. And it's worth remembering that even lacking direct physical conflict, there are plenty of ways to hurt someone that you don't like. And today, that's true whether you're an individual with a grudge, 
or a corporate entity that has been victimized and wants to take down its aggressor. There's still a decent-sized gap between where we are now and where we might end up, the somewhat extreme version of events that I just described. Currently, at least in countries like the U.S., corporations taking non-legal and non-economic actions against an opponent is punishable. They can aggressively outmaneuver their competitors in the global markets and in the courtroom, and I suppose in the press, if we want to view public relations efforts that way. But using any other type of force is not okay. If an opponent is going to be punished, they'll be punished by the law. The same is true for an individual. You can punish an opponent, but only if you do so through the courts, by calling the police on them, by allowing the legal system to deal with them. If you do anything more direct than that, if you attack them physically, if you take their money, if you hack their computer, you are also a criminal, and you can then be punished by the government. This could change in the near future, however. The Active Cyber Defense Certainty Act, or ACDC, and yes, that is the actual acronym that they're currently using, was announced by a U.S. representative from Georgia in March of 2017, and an updated version was released a few months later, in May. The crux of this act is that a hacking victim should be able to hack their attacker back, legally. At the moment, this is not the case. Counterhacking is something that must be legally left to the government. This act, though, says, essentially, screw that, I have the right to defend myself. And so long as the counterhacking is launched as an effort to identify the original hacker, to prevent future attacks, or to retrieve stolen files, it is all kosher, according to the law. At this time, this act has only been presented to gain further comment and to gauge interest. And there has been interest, but there's also a great deal of concern that it could lead to more escalation of hacking-related conflicts, causing more harm than good. And it could also result in more innocent victims, since hackers very often reroute their attacks through other people's servers to conceal the original source of the attack. So what we could see as a result of such an act going into effect is victims making more victims, attacking people they perceive to be their attackers, but who are not, in fact, their digital assailants. But the general concept still makes sense, if you look at it the right way. If the government isn't holding up its end of the bargain, and arguably, it isn't right now, because these types of threats are so new and so different from what's appeared before, it's kind of like with terrorism, these days. How do you defend an entire country's worth of people against an extremist with a van mowing down innocent civilians in a public place? How do you defend against professional hackers attacking non-military targets using military-grade cyber warfare tools? These types of attacks have become so asymmetric that those we're supposed to rely on to protect us are not, and arguably cannot, do so, not to the degree that one might want anyway. Which brings us around to an argument that will be familiar to many people here in the United States, the argument that is often made by Second Amendment enthusiasts, who defend the right to bear arms and to own and carry guns. The extreme situation that these people tend to imagine, and some of them no doubt already perceive as happening today, is similar to what I just described. It's a world in which we're being told to trust that the government has it all taken care of, when they clearly don't. And if we want to defend ourselves from threats, then we're lawbreakers. We're bad people. Second Amendment defenders want to have the right to fill the gaps between the government's promises and the government's capabilities. If you're being threatened by a criminal, you want the cops there right now, not five minutes from now. If you have your own weapon, the theory goes, you have rendered the cop somewhat unnecessary. That runs parallel to what we're talking about here, with corporate and private entities wanting to hack back, to attack those who are attacking them, to not just defend themselves, but to knock out bad actors so that not only do they fail to hurt their targets, but they walk away limping, and maybe they think twice before doing what they did in the future. And I can understand that feeling, though I will say that it all feels a little bit like a Wild West scenario to me. I understand the argument in favor of allowing anyone who wants to carry a weapon in public to do so, but the world that gun rights absolutists seem to imagine, one in which everyone, or at least most people, enough people to make a difference in a crime-related shootout, is one in which essentially you have to be on your guard 
you hold the power of life and death in your shoulder holster. And that means you're responsible should something go sideways. You've deputized yourself. Or if you're not a fan of the concept yet still live in such a world, you've almost certainly been deputized against your will. Because if everyone has a gun except you, well, that's kind of a hazardous situation to be in. You don't want to be the random townsperson caught in the crossfire in the Wild West shootout. You want to be capable of defending yourself. And if everyone is armed, everyone is legally allowed to tote around death machines, and in fact are encouraged to do so, then the world becomes a little more powder keg-like, whether you've got your own gun or not. So you might as well partake, lest you become the only person in the world incapable of defending yourself. The only victim in a world full of tech-enabled predators. Hacking, official hacking at least, has long been the legal jurisdiction of government entities. If Russia hacks the US, then the US hacks Russia, or comes up with another means of slapping them back in some way, to keep them from thinking they can just get away with that kind of thing. The same is true of individuals who hack the US. They're punished, usually legally, and then sometimes they're flipped over to our side to help us hack those who would hack us in the future. When the limitations disappear, though, and private enterprises are able to start hacking in retaliation, we are in some ways opening up all those gunpowder kegs and dousing the world with explosive dust. Many of these companies, including Microsoft and Google, have more resources than entire countries that they can then bring to bear. And in a lot of ways, they can leverage those resources more effectively than countries because they don't have the same infrastructural concerns that governments have. They don't need to take care of non-weaponized citizenry. The resources that they're defending are different. And in some cases, those resources can also be weaponized for use in retaliation as well. I have no doubt that private undercover black ops style retaliations of this kind have already happened between corporations. But if you begin to think of an entity like Google, or rather Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google, and many other massive tech companies, if you think of them as a nation state, filled to the brim with brilliant minds and wielding resources that some governments would struggle to attain, very much including influence with other corporations and with governments around the world, and if you imagine them as newly empowered rough and tumble players in any fight that breaks out, they start to look a little bit menacing, don't they? Because although governments can bring a lot of might to bear, including asymmetric resources that private hackers wouldn't have access to, like access to the fundamental infrastructure of the internet, corporations can, due to their influence, often bring similar resources to bear, plus their ability to act unilaterally, without needing to get any Congress involved, without needing to go through bureaucratic systems. This is one of the benefits of conducting military and intelligence actions under the rule of an autocrat, and it could be argued that corporations would enjoy that same advantage. I want to leave you with a few final angles from which you can view this topic when you're mulling over it in the future. First, telling corporations that they cannot retaliate is a stance that is largely unenforceable. What does it do to the perceived authority of a government if they insist upon making laws and taking stands like that that they cannot enforce? Second, I have seen arguments in favor of making all hacking legal, which could conceivably then force all governments and companies and individuals to become very solid, unassailable assets, within just a few years, you would have to become well defended because hacking would suddenly be legal. Now, this is an extreme idea and not terribly feasible, but it's essentially the same as allowing everyone in a given country to carry whatever weapon they might choose whenever they like, wherever they like, and telling them to defend themselves if necessary, and hell, take other people's stuff if you can get away with it. Are there any more realistic options out there? that might help us arrive at that same level of security, both communal and governmental, and I guess individual security as well, but without the craziness of making highly damaging illegal acts legal first to attain that status. And finally, how might empowering corporations to act unilaterally with force 
change them? Might we accidentally incentivize, I don't know, Kellogg to send a private military strike force to take out Boko Haram or some other terrorist organization as a marketing gimmick, as a way to get in the news, to get good PR? What incentives that currently exist intersect with such a decision and what might happen as a result of those intersections? There are a lot of conversations that we're going to need to have as a global society about the place of government in the modern interconnected world and about what happens when non-governmental players, be they individuals or Kellogg, come to wield powers similar to those traditionally wielded by governments and governments alone. We also need to make predictions about what to expect as our current corporatocracy, or pseudo-corporatocracy, evolves into something new. And whatever that new thing happens to be, it will likely alter a great deal of what we've come to take for granted about how the world operates and who governs those operations. And any prediction that we can make now will help us, one, not be caught off guard so badly, but two, hopefully lay some groundwork that will make that eventual transition a little bit more tolerable for everyone involved. <music> If you are enjoying this podcast, there are many different ways that you can help support it, that you can contribute to its continued production. You can leave a review up on iTunes. You can share the show with a friend or with your social network of choice. If you'd like to get some additional content and an ad-free version of the show and to participate in discussions about the show as well with fellow listeners and with myself, you can become a patron over on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also contribute monetarily through PayPal or Venmo. You can buy one of my books if you care to over at colin.io. And you can also check out our sponsors, the first of which today is Everlane. Everlane is my favorite clothing company. They make really beautiful garments that are simple and they are not trendy. They're not fast fashion. These are things that go with everything and they tend to last. They are not of any particular time. They're not covered in logos. I really do enjoy the clothes made by this company. And if you go to letsnotethings.com slash Everlane, a percentage of whatever you buy will be given as a contribution to this show. So I would never encourage anybody to buy things that they don't need, but if you do currently have a gap in your wardrobe that you're looking to fill, Everlane is a wonderful option, and by purchasing through that link, letsnotethings.com slash Everlane, you can fill that gap in your wardrobe while also kind of passively contributing to the show at the same time. So it's a nice win-win. And the other sponsor today is HostGator, my hosting company of choice. Whether you want to start a blog or a great big business on the internet, they have a hosting option for you. If you go to hostgator.com slash LKT, you will receive a substantial discount off of their already excellent prices. Hostgator.com slash LKT. The book that I would like to recommend today is called Thinking with Type by Ellen Lupton. And I find myself recommending this book a whole lot to people who email me asking for recommendations, particularly people who are involved in any visual field, but also people involved in publishing, and even people who just want to get a little bit more from the world around them to be able to see things that have always been there but they've never noticed before. Typography is one of those fields that's very obscure, and you can usually tell a really good graphic designer if they understand typography as opposed to if they just make beautiful things, because it really is the geekiest aspect of design that you can probably investigate and spend time on. But it's something that anybody can benefit from, and knowing just a little bit about typography will allow you to see all kinds of things that you never noticed before in the world around you, but it'll also help you beautify anything that you make and communicate more clearly much in the same way that using the proper words in a given scenario help you communicate more clearly. Displaying those words in the proper way also helps you communicate more clearly. And you might not even realize that you're taking away from your message or sending a confusing message, but learning about typography will help you avoid making that type of mistake. And so a great place to start to get a broad overview, but also some wonderful deep dives into the topic of typography is Thinking with Type by Ellen Lupton. I would recommend, if you can, getting a paperback version of this rather than an ebook. I don't even know if there's an audiobook version. I don't think it would translate well, but the paperback version is wonderful, as tends to be the case with most design books. It's laid out very intentionally, 
and I think you'll get a lot of value out of it. That's Thinking with Type by Ellen Lupton. You can find out more about me and my work if you go to colin.io. My blog is at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode at letsnotethings.com. You can find me pretty much everywhere on the internet at Colin is my name. Feel free to say howdy. Thank you so much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Thank you.